good. All right. Would you welcome Jasdan Strickland? Let's take a moment just to stand to our feet and honor the presence of God. Just in a moment, I want you to just begin to invite the Holy Spirit to touch you. Holy Spirit, right now, I thank you for your presence that's already in this place. Lord, I thank you for the manifestation of the glory of God. I thank you that realms of revelation, revelation knowledge, let it begin to be poured into your people in Jesus' mighty name. Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, we pray, God, that it will begin to open our eyes to new depths of your resurrection, new depths of who you are, and new depths even of the face of God. Lord, we thank you for giving us supernatural impartation of the glory realm and pouring into us fresh fire for this next season, Lord, that you desire to bring your church into. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come with your glory fire, that you would begin to come with your anointing of fire, that the fire of God would begin to be released, Lord, in a new way, in a new way in this region, in a new way in New Jersey. Lord, we thank you that the numbers here do not matter. But, Lord, it is all about the manifestation of your glory. So, Lord, let the ladder be extended up between earth and heaven. And let your angels begin to descend and ascend in this place, bringing breakthrough, bringing deliverance, bringing healing, and bringing revelation. Father, I pray that the entire atmosphere would be filled, Lord, with the glory presence of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So I'm very excited, and once again, I'm honored to be here. Um, we came from Jacksonville, Florida, and um, I want to start off by, by first warning you. Um, and I want to warn you that I am um, not really an ordinary preacher. Um, so I know I was, uh, so, I, so I said earlier that I would be teaching um, on dreams, which I will do. Uh, but I'm always one that I do like to be sensitive to what I sense in the spirit. And I begin to feel such a realm of revelation um, begin to open up. And um, that realm of revelation that's opening up, there are some things that I believe that God wants to continue to pour into this region. And so I want to start off first by telling you some things about myself before I even begin to minister. I tell people um, I, I love to go places where people do not know me. Um, and the reason why is because now there's not an expectation from me. You must put all your expectation in God. I, I love that because I, in my travel, I travel coast to coast. I travel internationally. And I'll be honest, uh, we begin to look so much to people's anointings that uh, we do not really sometimes realize that in that we forget to put our focus on the glory realm of God. Um, as a person that understands the anointing, there are some things I could say, but the, the anointing primarily deals with the earth dimension. And so what this means is if the presence of God does not come into a gathering, I can still minister in my anointing. Um, and, and so because of that, this is one of the reasons why we start to see repetition in gatherings, why conferences uh, we look exactly the same. It's, it's because we, we've t we have to put our attention back on simply the glory of God. Um, and so let me start off by saying this. Uh, my wife and I, we just had our fifth baby. Um, so, yeah, baby number five. And um, so he is uh, two months old. And um, I, I'm excited about him. He's a big guy. We call him our mega baby. Um, so he was born and he was uh, close to, I think he was almost 10 pounds. So, so big baby, he's tall, he's in like the 90th percentile in everything. So he's a big guy, so I miss him actually. Can't wait to get back and see my wife and family. Um, so also, 
um, we planted a ministry in Jacksonville, Florida called Ignite the Globe. Um, so we planted it uh, supernaturally. I had no intention on ever planting a church. I'm not interested really in planting a church. Um, and we ended up just obeying God in this plant um, and the Lord speaking to us. And I'll tell you a couple of things that I really believe that the church must be prepared for. Now, I was... Um, as I've been traveling around, there are certain messages. It's not that you're recycling them. It's just that it's the word of the Lord um, that it, God is having you to release in different territories at times. Um, and this is what the Lord has been dealing with me on. Um, and it goes back to Acts chapter 1. Now, many people, when we begin to think about Acts chapter uh, Acts in any form, most people begin in Acts chapter 2. Um, and the Lord highlighted Acts chapter 1, and there's a reason why I believe God is highlighting this to us. If you go to Acts chapter 1, uh, there's a few things that you'll see. Let's go ahead and read it, because I want to, I'm actually going to be teaching on deliverance, <laughs> but, the, but this is going to be unusual because I'm going to begin first by talking about the glory. Um, but in order for us to, to really grasp fully what God is saying, I want you to see this. Um, and let's begin. I'm just going to go ahead and read, starting from verse number 3. And I'm, I'm reading in the Amplified Version. And it says, To these men he also showed himself alive after his passion, and with many unfailable proofs and unquestionable demonstrations, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and talking to them about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, this is a very important verse that we just read because it actually reveals to us why we have the infilling of the spirit but are not fully manifesting what they manifested in the early church. And here's why. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is describing that Jesus had, had died. He had gone to the cross. He had gone to the belly of hell. He has, watch this, he had been raised and resurrected, but he had not ascended yet. There was a period of time of 40 days where Jesus had not ascended. And the Bible lets us know what Jesus was doing during this time. He was showing himself to be alive. It says, with many unfailable proofs. But, but pay attention to the main thing that he was doing. It says he was teaching them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. These were things that he could not teach them during the three years that they walked with him. So he was pouring revelation knowledge into them. Now, what revelation knowledge is, we know revelation means to uncover something that is secret, something that is hidden. But in the spirit realm, because everything that God makes, he, he finished and completed it even all the way back into Genesis when the Bible says this is the, the history or the genealogy or the generations of the earth. So it lets us know that God made everything in, in how many days? Six so he makes everything in six days, and then he rested on the seventh. Now, why did God rest? He rested because on the sixth day, he had reduplicated himself. So that meant from that day forward, there would be a man that would do his function in the earth. There was no more a need for him to work in the earth because he had reduplicated a man with his DNA. So there was a man that could do exactly what he could do, Adam. And so what this means is in the beginning, everything was completed. So everything is finished. Everything is done. So revelation is connected to an eternal realm where God uncovers things from before the foundation of the world. So this means that revelation is never really new. It's just new to our ears. Okay, so, so he's unveiling things that are eternal. Now, this is important for us to understand. So revelation is not mental. It's not intellectual. So because it's not intellectual, it's not something that we can access by reason. 
And this gives us uh, one of the reasons why here in America, why there is, there's demonstration, but it's not to the degree of some other countries. And it's not because God is different. The reason why the realm of demonstration is lesser in the United States is because here the gospel is more intellectual. The gospel has never been intellectual. In fact, whenever Jesus would teach, the Bible says that the Pharisees would reason in their mind. Now, that reasoning in their mind, why is this important to gather? They were trying to grasp and receive from an eternal realm with a natural intellect. And so when they were trying to do this, it was hindering the manifestation of them actually receiving the word that they were hearing. So, so hear what I'm saying. So intellect, knowledge, natural knowledge, natural wisdom has no access into the eternal. It has no access into the eternal. Now let me say this. Here in the United States, when you hear a preaching like uh, Lazarus being raised from the dead, when you begin to hear this teaching, we begin to talk about situations being raised. And one reason why is because it's easier to tell the people that God will raise their situation than it is to tell them that God raises the dead. And so what we've done is without realizing it, we have slowly watered down the supernatural in the Bible. God, I feel, I feel this. I said we've watered down the supernatural in the Bible. So for 40 days, Jesus poured into them secrets and mysteries of the kingdom and then in Acts 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is important because, watch this, we have the filling, but God must catch us up in the revelation. The Bible tells us that God wants to enlighten the eyes of our heart. Now, watch what it says in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. It tells us he wants to enlighten the eyes of our heart so that we can know. What is the hope of his calling, but this is another key, and the inheritance inside of you. So revelation is a key that unlocks the manifestation of what's already in you. What this also means is you can't move into what you don't have a revelation of. This is why I say we're filled with the Spirit but because of a lack of revelation, we're not moving in the potential of our sonship yet in the United States. Oh, my goodness, I feel this. So, Acts 2, once again, they were filled with the Spirit. Now, remember, and before we get to the upper room, the Bible says that Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So, in that moment, they received new birth. That's what they received in that moment. Because we know that the foundation of our faith, you must first accept that Jesus died, but you also have to accept that Jesus rose from the dead in order to be saved. That means that before this point, everything that even the apostles were doing was under the law. And it meant that they were not yet born again. And that's why the moment that they accepted that Jesus had risen, that's why Jesus could now breathe on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So, so they receive the Holy Spirit. They receive supernatural knowledge. They receive things that you cannot really study, things that the Holy Spirit must uncover and unveil to us. And then they receive the infilling. Now, I want to I say this. I want you to think of Jesus' three years of ministry. I want you to think of the things they saw, the things that they witnessed. They saw Jesus walk on water. And I'll present this to you. I want you to think of this. When they witnessed Jesus walk on water, they had already saw Jesus heal the sick by this point. They had already saw Jesus raise the dead. They had already saw Jesus prophesy. When they saw Jesus walk on the water, they thought it was a ghost because it was a realm of the supernatural that they had not experienced yet, even though they were already in the supernatural. This is what the Holy Spirit said to me concerning America. He said, America, you have seen the supernatural, but you have not seen the realm that's coming in the next wave yet. There's another wave of the glory of God that is coming to America 
And it's going to be so advanced that there will be many that if they are not equipped with revelation before it comes, they will misinterpret the depth of the supernatural and say that it is witchcraft. Because it, it will be more advanced. It will be no different than the disciples were. The, I, I want you to think of them. They witnessed all of that. But yet, when they saw the new realm, because human nature is that whatever I don't understand, it must be either explained away or it's accredited to the devil. This is how, this is how it works. And this is one of the reasons why there are certain dimensions in God that the church has abandoned and even allowed the occult to begin to step into. This is good. So, so watch this. The Bible tells us that uh, with Daniel and his three friends, it says that according to the Babylonian system, they were found to be ten times greater than the astrologers and the magicians of their day. These were not people that just walked around with crystals, by the way. These, these, these were not people that just had a little bit of sage and burned it. No. They were the types of people that guided nations through false revelation. They were the types of people, like going back to even to the days of Moses, because this is the category of men these were. They were the type of men that when, when Moses threw his staff down, it says that they also threw their staffs down, and their staffs became snakes just like Moses did. Now, here's the question that I'll present to you. If we were present in one room, and Moses was here, and then on the other side, the magicians are there. They both throw their, uh, their uh, staffs down. They both become serpents. Who's the warlock? How do you know what's, what's false? What's, and I told you that today Moses would have been viewed as a warlock. But what God did is he used the serpent, see, because the Pharaoh would, upon the hat that he would wear on his head, you would see a serpent. God was showing them power from the way they understood it. Oh, my goodness, I feel this. This is good. So, now, once again, I got to warn you. I have not started teaching yet. I got to warn you. So, so, here's what I'm saying. So, so revelation, revelation is required. For the church to begin to advance and to begin to accelerate. And whenever there has been a lack of revelation, the church has begun to decline. And, and the mistake that I think even the current apostolic and prophetic move can even make can be the mistake that many denominations that were moves of God previously made. And it was that they believed that there was nothing coming next. They believed that there was nothing after what they had received, what they had operated in. Because the idea is, once again, I saw the supernatural. I've, I've prophesied. I cast out devils. I do that. But there are realms within realms within realms. The Bible says that God is from everlasting to everlasting. Oh, my goodness. I love this. So, so once again, let's keep going. So, so I want to continue to, to lay a little bit of foundation before I really get into um, a couple things about deliverance that I think will be um, really good. So one reason why, why am I talking about the glory before I begin to go into deliverance? One reason why is because um, the Lord spoke to me about the imbalance in the deliverance ministry today. Um, and, and one of the imbalances is this. I do not want to know more about the devil than I do about the glory. That's, that's my personal opinion. Now, now, I'll tell you that I, I, I have no problem with deliverance, by the way. Um, some call me a deliverance minister. I don't take titles, though. I don't accept, like, one role because I believe, just like the Bible says, that the Holy Spirit, it says rivers of living water will flow out of your belly. That's not one river. That's many rivers are inside of the belly of every single believer. That means there's not a dimension that you can't touch and that you can't access as a son. So that means I don't have to just be a miracle guy. I don't have to just be a healing guy. I don't have to just be a guy that cast out devils. I don't have to just be. I can be all that I saw Jesus manifest in the earth. Okay? So, so let me continue to lay a little foundation. Now, remember the 40 days that I was talking about in Acts chapter 1 where Jesus is pouring revelation. 
Now, to understand this, we, we have to understand that Moses had an encounter that was similar. In fact, if I was to teach on the Jewish feast, I could actually show you how both of these things happen in the same time period. When you look at, um, we'll keep going. I, I, we'll see how deep into this I get. Uh, but the thing I want you to see is that Moses, he goes up the mountain of God. This is after the first Passover. So Passover was instituted. They go into the wilderness after, remember, after they leave out of Egypt, after the nine wonders. And once they leave out of Egypt, Moses goes up the mountain of God. How many days? 40. Now, this is important. When he comes down the mountain the second time, it says his face shined with glory. This was the glory of the old covenant. So, this is important to understand that the glory that was shining and emanating from him was because he was the mediator of that covenant. Oh, my goodness. So, the glory was shining and emanating from Moses that he experienced on the mountain of God. And notice this, for generations all the way until the time of the new covenant, the way that you access God was the revelation that God gave Moses. So when you get to Malachi and when you get into the beginning of the book of Matthew, we end up in this period where there's a lack of the supernatural. But, but it's not by God's design. The lack of the supernatural is because they, begin, they disconnected from the revelation that came during the 40 days. This is what I'm presenting to you. Here in the United States, the church has moved away from the revelation that Jesus poured into the original church in the 40 days and nights. And just like the Pharisees, just like the Pharisees, they, they continued in tradition. But, but this is what it looks like in the United States. Revelation is replaced and substituted with motivation. Faith is replaced and substituted with positivity. Like what if I told you that positivity is not faith? And that it has nothing to do with faith. So, watch this. So, in Scripture it says, now faith. Someone say, now faith. Is the substance. I got to stop there. I want to keep reading, but I got to stop. Notice it does not say faith is a mindset. It says faith is a substance. So, remember this. Faith, belief, and hope are related, but they're not the same. Belief is your system of thought that can be renewed by the word of God. Faith is revelatory in nature. That means that where there's not revelation, there will not be faith. Oh, my God. That's why it says faith cometh. Notice, notice what it says. It cometh. That means it's attached to revelation. So when God speaks within his voice is the faith to believe what he said. Oh, my God, I feel this. So, so watch this. Now faith is the substance of, watch what it says, of things. So faith is the substance of a thing. Then it says the evidence of things that are not seen. So this gives us another detail. You cannot really preach faith if you disconnect it from the unseen. Oh, my goodness. I said you cannot really preach faith if you disconnect it from the unseen. Because the very, uh, watch this, the very uh, description that God gives faith in the scriptures in Hebrews 11 and 1 is that faith is a substance of a thing in the invisible world. Now, I told you in the beginning that, that when you're reading Genesis, you are seeing God complete all of creation. That means he's not making things now. God. <laughs> he's not making things now. He finished. So what is faith? It's to, what's this? It's to see or to get a revelation of what's in the invisible. So I can be positive without knowing what's there. 
So faith begins with a revelation. Faith begins when God shows you what's in the invisible. When he speaks to you about what's in the invisible. So there's a difference between walking, seeing a car I want and going, that's my car, that's my car, that's my car, I believe it, I believe it. That's just positivity. There's a difference when God shows you. Uh, we're starting to see it now. There's a difference when the Lord speaks to you. Because when he speaks, he's showing you something that's completed, that's a thing in the invisible. You see that? So whenever faith is disconnected from the invisible, when it's disconnected from the supernatural realm, and that's why I told you the church in America has been doing a disservice by not teaching people the supernatural. Because by not teaching them the supernatural, we are unknowingly disconnecting them from the realm of faith. And when we're disconnected from the realm of faith, this is the thing. Faith also just so happens to be the entryway into the spiritual dimension. Mm, I feel this. Okay, so let's keep going. So, so now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of of things that are not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, watch this, y'all. Through faith, we understand. Through faith, we understand that the worlds, someone say worlds. Now, notice that that's, it does not say world. Through faith, we understand that the world, plural form, Spirit world, natural world. The worlds were framed by the word of God. So, this lets us know that when we see in scripture, when it says in the beginning, this is, I, I, I feel such, a, I, I think I can go deep tonight. I, I really do. Um, it says in the beginning, someone say in the beginning. It says God created the heavens and the earth. Now, Remember that because there's something that I want you to keep hold of because I'm about to show you something about this realm that, that we need to know as, as sons in the end times that we need to know. Now, remember I told you in the, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, when it says beginning, what does that mean? When it says in the beginning, what does it mean? Now, of course, the, the appropriate answer is it means it's the beginning. But, but the beginning of what? And I want to show you. It, number one, it's not the beginning of God. It's not the beginning of God. Now, now, the next thing people will tell me is, well, it's the beginning of time. I agree and disagree. And I'll show you why. Now, watch this. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, what this means, because the scriptures tell us, that the heavens and the heavens of the heavens cannot contain God. Now that sounds, now, now listen to me, that sounds crazy if you're thinking of it from a natural, intellectual, reason standpoint. But the same way that the fullness of God dwells, watch this, first it dwelled in the Ark of the Covenant. God was able to take his full glory and put it inside of a little ark, and it did not diminish his size. God is able under the new covenant to put the entire, not just his Holy Spirit, the entire kingdom of God is inside of you. Hmm. This means the throne is in you. This means that the river that you read about in Revelation is inside of you. Now, that sounds crazy, but I'm going to use a word, and I'm going to call it bilocation. You know how in Scripture it says you have the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? Two different realms of the same kingdom. You know what the kingdom of God? It is God's heavenly kingdom being manifested through man. Huh. What does it mean? That means the throne is in heaven and in you at the same time. That's why I said the term bilocation. Just like Adam or us, let's just use us, you're seated in heavenly places, but you're sitting in that seat right now. 
Now watch this. Let's keep going. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now let's fast forward. Day number four. God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now when you look at your watch, did you know that all time is connected to the earth's rotation around the sun? That means time did not exist in the earth until day four. So when it says in the beginning, it wasn't talking about time as you know it, as I know it. It was referring to the beginning of eternity. God lived, he always was. Eternity had a beginning. And the beginning stemmed from he who is eternal. So when you read in Genesis, it says, he, am I, are we good? You guys got me? So, so when you read in Genesis and it says, in the beginning, that was eternity's beginning. God created a realm and decided to live in it. It's no different than when you build a house and decide to live in it. <laughs> he built a world that reflected his nature and chose to live within it. But then he builds another world. So, so I'm giving you the, the main purpose of heaven because, because there's something I want you to see. Did you know that when, watch this, the Bible says in the Beatitudes, the meek will do what? Why would you inherit the earth? If when we, if when Jesus returns, we're not going to live here. Did you know that the earth is the inheritance of the sons and daughters of God? So God is bringing us back to the original intent from the beginning. And, and where did he put Adam and Eve? He put them on the earth. Now watch this. Oh my goodness, this is good. So, so watch this. It says this. It says... Huh, there's so much I want to say. It says that God said, let us create man in our image and in our likeness. It says, male and female, he created them. He called their name Adam. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that he foreknew us. Now, when you read in Genesis chapter 2, that God took the dirt of the earth and formed man. That was not man's beginning. That was man's beginning on earth. Man's beginning was in Genesis 1. Genesis 2 is when man was given a body. Ah. Hmm. There's so much here. So he was given a body. But there's something that, that I want you to see, and there's a reason why I'm telling you this. He gives, he gives man a body, and man begins, there's a, there's a foundational shift that I want you to see. The moment that God made man, there was a shift. And this was the shift. Notice that God then brings the animals to Adam. Why did he do that, though? From that moment, if you notice... God went from speaking into creation to speaking to man. And then man began to speak to creation on behalf of God. Now, if you, if you go, and, and I don't have time to go there because there's so many places I want to go, but if you look at Genesis 1, when God begins it, when he says, let us create man in our image and likeness, he then says, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. This is before he formed man. From the dust of the earth. You know what that means? God had a brief, even with us individually, before you were born, the Lord spoke to your spirit about what you were called to do. Uh, so, so watch this. So that's why when you get a prophecy, you may have never heard it before. Now, there are people that teach and they say things like, all prophecy uh, it is, is just confirmation. I completely disagree with that because the first prophecy I ever got, I had no idea that that was what God was calling me to do. And so it wasn't a confirmation to me. I don't think prophecy was a confirmation to David when he, when he realized that he would be king over Israel because he didn't know it before. 
I don't think prophecy was, well, I, says the, I don't think it was confirmation to Mary when she found out that she would carry Jesus. So a lot of things that are taught uh, um, traditionally in the church, we have to be careful not to just regurgitate what we heard someone say. Because some of these things that are being taught are making people reject prophecies that are actually from the heart and mind of God. And they reject them because they say, I didn't know that already. So hear what I'm saying. So, so when you get a prophecy, how would you know it was true? Because your spirit bared witness with it. But how did your spirit bear witness if your spirit didn't know? Uh, that means your spirit knew, your mind just didn't know. <laughs> did you, you know what learning is in the supernatural, seriously? Learning is rehearsing. It's a rehearsal. You know, okay, let me use the word, the renewal of the mind. Now, if you have Netflix and your subscription runs out, you have to renew it. That means that you previously had it. The renewal of the mind is God restoring a knowledge that God had already given man. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm almost where I want to be. So, so I want you all to see this. So, so the Bible says things that do appear are not made of things that appear. So what this means is that the invisible world, so when God created the heavens and the earth, notice the heavens are mentioned first. The reason the heavens are mentioned first is this, is, this created a principle that God does things in the spirit first. And, and it makes the supernatural, this term, the realm of origination. So the supernatural is the realm of origination. That means anything that is in this world must come from that realm first. That's what I mean when I say things that do appear, so things you can see, are not made of things that do appear. Okay, so what does this mean about heaven? This is, this is my fun part. This is what I want to get to. God did not really need heaven. He wanted heaven. Because according to scripture, now let me say it like this. If heaven was before God, then heaven would be God. God made heaven. Okay? So, this means he existed without it. Oh, my. <laughs> he made it because he wanted it. He chose to dwell there, but he still doesn't technically need it. He just wants it. So, 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 what, so what else is heaven for if he didn't need it to exist? Many people teach heaven like God needed heaven to exist. No, he wanted heaven. He chose by his own will as God to make a world that was suited for him. But then he made another world, but he supplied that second world from the first. So do you know what heaven is? Heaven is a resource center for the earth. So what this means is as long as there's a heaven, you will never actually be in lack. The key is learning how to access what's in heaven. And this is what faith is for. That's why faith is having a revelation of what's in heaven. Of what's in the invisible. Why? Because revelation, there's another thing that revelation does. Revelation is also... One of the prerequisites for something to enter the earth. So, so I'll give you a couple examples. So you know how the Bible says, surely the Lord shall do nothing. Someone say nothing. So he won't do anything. And it says, unless he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. Now, I, I don't want to, for all our prophets that are in the room, I don't want you to feel bad. Uh, but I want you to know that that verse was written in the old covenant. So... It's not that prophets don't still initiate agendas of heaven through their mouth. But it's also this. The principle of that is no longer just for prophets. Now it's a principle of revelation. God will do nothing until it's revealed. Oh, my goodness. 
So now we know another reason why the devil doesn't want the church to come into Revelation. Because God will do nothing until it's revealed. <laughs> this is good. So God needs, just as he needed Adam to name the animals, because he gave Adam dominion in the earth. That means in this realm, God follows his own authority that, in, watch this, that he created. That's why, watch this, he came to the earth as a man. He had to come as a man because I gave man dominion here. So, so oh my goodness. So, Oh, this is good. So he follows his own, he, watch this, he's so integral that he won't go back and reverse what he established originally. He said, what I'll do, I'll come as a man and redeem creation as a man. Adam fell, I'll come as Adam. <laughs> so what this means is what theology calls the first Adam is a bit of an error. He was the first, watch this, really, Adam was patterned after the original. But I'll say it this way. If Adam was the original Adam and he fell, we would have lost the blueprint of Adam. Adam was fashioned after Adam. The original was Jesus. Jesus is the original. <laughs> Adam was just sitting here first. <laughs> okay. This is fun. So, so let's continue. Now, now, there's a few things I want you to see, and, and, I, and I'm almost to, to this actual teaching. <laughs> um, this is fun, though, because we must know our authority in order to do deliverance, in order to, to effectively do deliverance ministry, especially territorial deliverance, we need to know who we are as sons. And, and I want you to see this. Um, the Bible says, Jesus, he said an unusual prayer. It was an unusual prayer that Jesus prayed. Um, and, and it was, Father, the glory that I had with you in the beginning. He asked for that glory to be restored. Now, if I don't lay a certain framework, it can almost sound blasphemous what I'm about to teach you. What I found is that sometimes spiritualities, they sound blasphemous when there's a lack of understanding. And this is one of the reasons why when Jesus spoke, they said he was committing blasphemy. It was around the exact same revelation, too. And guess what that revelation was? Sonship. Today, we have a generation that, that we say Daddy God without really knowing what that means to be a son. But the Bible says that Jesus brought many sons or reconciled many sons into the glory. So sonship, by definition is a person that's been reconciled back to the glory realm that Adam fell from. So when it says Adam fell, it's not like, I don't want you to think fell like stumble. Think fall like being in a place and falling out of it. Adam fell out of the glory. Or I'll say it this way. Adam was disconnected from the glory dimension. So Jesus, one of the reasons that Jesus died it was for the forgiveness of sin, yes, but it was also to restore man back to the glory dimension. The glory is normal for you. The glory is not something that's difficult for the church to access, no. The, the glory is not something that hopefully we can gain if we just work hard enough to come into. No, the glory is your normal reality. And so, so, so watch this. So Jesus brought many sons into the glory, but back to the prayer. Jesus said this, this prayer, and he said, Lord, our Father, the glory that I had with you in the beginning, that I had with you in the beginning, he asked for God to restore it. Then he also prays that as I am one with you, make them one with me. He begins to pray that the glory that, that he has been given by the Father will be given to us. Now, 
But there's a, a, a small thing that I must say that, that I want you to grab. Jesus also, or, or in Scripture, it also says this, as he is, so are we. But where? In this world. It's back to the original intent. Adam was as God is. He could do everything God could do in the earth. Now, as he is, so are we in this world. So in other words, what God is in heaven, who Jesus is in heaven, that is what you are in the earth. That's what, that's what he's saying. It's not what you're becoming through death. It's not what you're becoming when you die. Because once again, as I said, the original intent of God is that God will cause us to inherit the earth. So will we be raptured? Yes, but we will be back here still. I, say, I like to say it like this. You'll have a dual citizenship, which is what you already have. Now, this is good. So this means that when Jesus came, he left a glory that he had with the Father. That's what it means. Okay, so you know how the Bible talks about his crucifixion, and it says when he entered into his glory? You must understand what that means. It's saying that he entered back into a glory he left. Uh, okay, let's go further. This, 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 uh, this is, I'm enjoying this, by the way. So Jesus, remember he raises from the dead. So now he has been resurrected from the dead, which is the greatest, uh, the greatest miracle that will ever be done in history. There's no sign greater. There's no miracle greater. It's the resurrection. I love to preach the resurrection. I preach the resurrection almost every week in one way, shape, or form. I, find, I could be teaching on marriage, and I'll find a way to get back into the resurrection. Um, but, but my point that I, that I want to go into, that I want you to see, is that notice that after he rose from the dead, we see in Luke 24 that there was two disciples. Now, notice it says disciples. That means these were not casual followers. These were people that followed Jesus everywhere that he went. These were people that they had given up things to follow Jesus, just like the other disciples. So these were very dedicated learners, people that were disciplined, people that were taking his teachings and growing in them. And as it happens, it says they were talking about Jesus, how he had been crucified, but they were actually talking about how he must not be the Messiah because they were saying that it's the third day today and they didn't see him. The problem was Jesus walked right up to them and when he walks up to them, he begins to converse with them about how Jesus had been, had been crucified. And long story short, they don't recognize him. They're talking directly to Jesus, and they don't recognize him. There's a reason that I want you to understand. In his resurrection, there was a change. This is something that I want you to understand. In Jesus' resurrection, there was a change. He was not the same as he was when he was in the earth for the three years. Okay? So, so watch this. So, so he goes to their home. He sits down. He, he talks to them. He begins to explain the gospel. He begins to break down the law and the prophets. He begins to explain it all the way from the beginning. I would have loved to be in that meeting. Um, and as he was explaining it from the beginning, this means it was a long time, by the way. It would take a long time to explain all the law and the prophets. Um, here's the thing that I want you to see, though. It says their eyes were opened. And then all of a sudden, they could see him. This is the next principle of revelation. Revelation opens the spiritual eyes to see realms of God that are otherwise invisible to us. So... They see Jesus for who he is now. Oh, my goodness. Now, then there's this thing called the ascension. So you have the resurrection, but then there's the ascension. He changes again. There was another change again. John, who put his head on the chest of Jesus, knew his heart beat. He saw Jesus in a way. They had never saw him before with fire in his eyes, hair like wool, 
He was like the sun shining in his strength. Hmm. He saw Jesus as he is now. What am I saying? In scripture when it says that as he is, notice that word is. He that was, he that is. That's his present reality. His present, what he is presently. This means when he says you are as he is, he's not even talking about the three years of his ministry. He's referring to him glorified. You are, we are not waiting to die to get a glorified body. The idea that religion has given us is you become glorified when you die and go to heaven and hallelujah. No. According to the same verse that says we're predestinated, we're justified, the same exact verse in Romans says that, you are, that he also glorified us. What he is, that is what is in your spirit now. Oh my goodness, I feel God. There's so much I want to say. So with that said, that is, if we were to define sonship, it's being exactly what he is in the earth. But then there's a term that Romans calls manifested son. So that means, we, it says we are given the power to become the sons of God. So we're sons, but are we manifesting sonship? So manifested sons doesn't mean there's not sons. It, it, it's, it's referring to sons that do what he's able to do. There's so much I could say, but I, I don't want to get too deep into it because I got to get into to, to what I really want to get into tonight. But, but this is the thing I'll say. If there was a word that can be used that would describe what Acts chapter 2 was and what the arrival of the Holy Spirit really is, it is the word secession. It's the word secession. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of background, and then we're going to get into the nice, fun, juicy stuff. Secession. Now, first let me lay this to you, and, and, I, and I want to say this because many people do this. They say things like, I wish I was alive during the times of the Bible. I love when I hear people say that. And, 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 and I want to give you a description of why. Did you know that if you were alive, and let's say that you were Jewish, during the times of the Gospels, that a small number of people carried the supernatural? Did you know that if you lived in a different nation, you were not Jewish, the ministry of the Holy Spirit was not really until Acts 2 expressed to many nations. What I'm saying is there's more activity today than there was then. So let me give you an example. Under the Old Covenant, it says, Numbers 12, it says that if there is a prophet among you, it says, I will speak to him in dreams and visions. That was for prophets. Today, that's, that's not the benchmark of being a prophet. You know why? Everybody has dreams and visions. So in the old covenant, Israel as a nation, they were not demonstrators of the supernatural as a nation. They experienced the supernatural and the prophets were demonstrators. So if, so if, you, so if you lived in and you were not a prophet, you couldn't carry or move in the supernatural. Oh, this is good. As of today, that's why Joel's prophecy is such an, like if you understood what it was like to think like them, to hear that word, that's groundbreaking. That not only are the prophets, the priest and the kings going to carry the anointing, but every single person, every son, every daughter, all of us can be demonstrators of the supernatural. That's the new covenant. That's now. That's the latter house, and that's the latter day glory. Now, we got to talk about the transfiguration really quickly. With the transfiguration, and, and, and by the way, how am I doing on time? Am, am I good? Okay. With the transfiguration, they go up to pray with Jesus. Jesus goes up the mountain of God to pray. 
And, and when he goes up the mountain to pray, there's, there's a lot that I could say there about that mountain. Um, but when he goes up the mountain to pray, like, do you know where the original Mount Sinai was? Or, or, or I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly. Right. Did you know that when Peter, I mean, when Paul was away in the wilderness, that's where one of the places he went and got revelation from? Just like Moses? There's a lot I could say. But anyway, Jesus, when they, when they began to pray, this is what it says. It says, Peter, James, and John, his strongest disciples, they fell asleep. So don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> and when they fall asleep, Jesus, when they wake up, they see Jesus transfigured. Jesus had pressed into a completely different dimension and realm of prayer from when they were awake. And when they woke up, it says they saw him. His clothes were shining. His face was shining. And then they saw Moses and they saw Elijah. This is so prophetic. Because what it represents is this. Moses represents the former glory. Elijah, now I know people will say, well, Elijah can't represent the latter day glory because he's an Old Testament prophet. But they don't under, people that say that don't have revelation. He was a Tishbite, which means he was not from one of the major tribes of Israel. It means that he had mixture. He was not fully Jewish. You know what it represented? The one new man. The end time church. The Jew and Gentile together. <laughs> so what were you seeing during the transfiguration? You were seeing the latter and former glory expressed through Jesus at once. Oh, my goodness. So what is a son in, in, in today? The, a son is someone that has revelation and can manifest the former and latter day glory. Just as it said that these glories would rain down at the same time. You know where we mess up? We teach about the new move of the spirit and then we disconnect it from the former glory. Did you know that it's hard to understand the end time glory without understanding where the glory originated from in the former? Hmm. So much I want to say. So, so in other words, let me say it like this. When we teach prophets, we only teach them the New Testament prophet. You have to understand that most of what can be taught to prophets is actually found in the Old Testament. Hmm. There's so much I, I want to say there. I'm not telling you prophets are mean. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you saying prophets start yelling at people. What I'm saying is most prophetic function is not found in the New Testament. To truly study a prophet, you have to go into the Old Testament to see what they're able to do, what their functions are, what their capacities are. And we've done that even with other realms. How do I feel this? That's why the Bible says the old and the new wine, which rep is represented by the old and new covenant, which is also represented by the former and the latter glory. This is what it says. Put the new wine in new wineskins and put the old wine in old wineskins so that they both are preserved. That means God's heart was to never get rid of the old wine. There are things that manifested then that God wants to bring into the present. Now, they won't be the exact same manifestations. I'm, I'm referring to the realms themselves. That's why they're called ancient paths. They're ancient because they have an origin in the former glory. <laughs> oh, my goodness, there's so much I want to teach. Okay, so, so what is a son? It's someone that knows the ancient paths. It's someone that understands. Like, I'll give you a couple examples. In the Bible, when it says prayer, that term is is, is a very commonly used word in the church, of course. But do you realize how ancient prayer is? In fact, when the disciples said, teach us how to pray, did you know that that wasn't the first time they saw a prayer? That was the first time they saw a prayer right. It was the first time they witnessed authentic, real, genuine prayer. Even though they had saw people going through the act of prayer. 
In fact, Jesus used a term he calls them, he called the Pharisees hypocrites. You know why, why he called them that? That was a profession at that time. They were stage performers. Jesus was calling the Pharisees stage performers. <laughs> but this is my point. Prayer is an ancient path. Knowing the way of prayer. Knowing the way of intercession. I hear people teach, just, just do whatever you want to do. Say whatever you want to say. That's prayer. God honors it. No, no, no. There's a way not to. There are 11 Hebraic words for the word prayer. Each word gives a different expression of prayer. Now, as I've traveled around, this is something I have noticed, and I've noticed this personally. I see some people, they say, well, you're supposed to be quiet when you pray. You're supposed to be still. Then another group will say, well, you're supposed to pray like this, and you're supposed to be loud. And you're supposed to... I have found that both are wrong and right. It depends on the leading of the Spirit and what needs to be done. There are times when you're being quiet when you should be loud. And there are times where you're being loud when you should be quiet. <laughs> so God wants to teach us the ancient paths. He wants us to understand his ways supernaturally. But this is what I want to lead to. Deliverance. I'm going to do this as quickly as I can. I'm, I'm not going to be long. Uh, but, but I want to say this. Deliverance is also an end time ministry. It is a ministry of the end times. Now, if you notice that Jesus, he ushered in a new pattern of deliverance that had never been seen before. That's why the Bible says in Mark chapter 1 that when Jesus cast the devil out of the man in the synagogue, it tells us this. It lets us know, it says that his fame went, it spread throughout the region. And the reason why, they had never saw deliverance like that. Now, at that time, there were exorcists. There were people that practiced exorcisms. This is why the sons of Sceva were professional exorcists. And it's actually kind of funny that they did exorcisms regularly. And, and what happened to them when we read about the sons of Sceva had never happened to them before until the new wave and pattern of deliverance was ushered in. But anyway, they had never saw authority to extract demons from people. They had saw deliverance in warfare. They had saw people experience, like, for example, the closest picture we have to it is when David played the harp. And when David played the harp, we saw the spirit would depart from Saul while he was in the atmosphere of David's worship. And then once the worship was gone, the spirit would come and return back to him. So it was still not a full picture of the New Testament deliverance under the New Covenant. And one reason why the deliverance ministry has authority to the degree that it does in the end times is that the authority that is exercised today in deliverance is found at the victory of the cross and resurrection of Jesus. And so it's very important to understand that in order to do a strong deliverance, we must come back to the reality of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. In order to do mighty deliverance, to see mighty deliverance. Now, we have a term that I'm going to use. And, of course, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail like I would like. But with the, with the blood of Jesus that's shed, I want you to know and remember the word remission. I want you to remember this word because this is also a word that strengthens us in the deliverance ministry. It helps us understand something. Remember that in the old covenant, sins are covered. That term is not a New Testament term, though. Sin is not covered now. See, when Jesus went to the cross, when his blood was shed in seven different ways, that blood also dealt with all sin going all the way back to the original fall of man. That means it was all still there. It was just covered, meaning that through the Jewish sacrificial system, God chose not to look at it, but it was still there. It was covered. But under the new covenant, we have the remission of sins. That word remission means to no longer exist. 
Oh, my goodness. This is what the blood of Jesus does when we repent of our sin. Our sins are forgiven, but not only are they forgiven, in the mind of God, they do not exist. Oh, my goodness. This strips demons of power. This strips them of authority because the way that they gain authority is through open doors of sin. This is good. So, so remember... The remission of sins in the new covenant. Now, this also will help us not just in the deliverance, but even in our mentality towards our proximity to God, that we can draw close to him because of the blood. That, that because of the blood of Jesus, I do not have to have. That's why the Bible says the blood of bulls and goats did not deal with the conscience. The Bible says that our conscience is purged by the blood of Jesus. The guilt of sin is removed from us. That means in the old covenant, they lived with a permanent state of guilt, even though their sins were covered. They walked around with a consciousness of sin that they knew because the sin still existed. But under the new covenant, we don't have to live with that same mindset. That's why it says there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So this also lets us know deliverance is a ministry of mercy. It's a ministry of mercy. So it's, so it's not a ministry that is uh, to, to simply judge what's wrong with individuals. It's a ministry that, that, that demonstrates the mercy and the love and the goodness of God. This also means that, that no matter where a person is in life, that the church is a safe place for them to experience deliverance. Because, because what, what you're going through what demons that have been present in people's lives and things like that, when they get free from them, it's okay because ministry is a, or deliverance is a love ministry. So remember this, that every time there's a deliverance, it, it, it further proves the victory of Christ's resurrection. It further proves God's dominion over the, Satan's kingdom. I love this. So when it comes to deliverance, what are some main things that I want to teach there? I, I know you guys already do deliverance here. And so I don't have to go all the way to the basics. But I want to talk about the realm of dreams as it relates to the deliverance ministry. I want to talk about the realm of dreams as it relates to the deliverance ministry. Now, I want everyone to, to hold on to this, this word uh, and hold on to it closely because your dreams are revealing the spiritual condition of your life. It's important to understand that your dreams are revealing the spiritual activity that is going on around you. So, so remember this. Some dreams are God speaking. Some dreams can also be your spirit seeing what's going on in the spirit world. So it's not necessarily God talking, it's just that you are a spirit. And so therefore, your, your spirit interacts with that realm. Okay? So sometimes, like for example, I could be in a room, and let's say that my spiritual eyes are open and I see an angel. It doesn't mean God's talking, I just see an angel. But then there are some times where an angel comes with a message and God is speaking to me. But that's not the case every time. So everything you see doesn't mean God's talking to you, it just means you're seeing, you're discerning, you're interacting. Okay? So, so the sources of dreams, number one, dreams can be God talking. Dreams can be God talking. Number two, dreams can just be your spirit being alert to activity around it. Number three, dreams can be uh, soulish in nature where you are just simply, um, let's say that uh, we could say it this way, your soul has eyes. Um, and you're seeing Things that are on your mind, things that you have been thinking about, memories that you've collected, things of that nature. And then lastly, we'll just put this under the category. It can also be uh, the voice of the enemy. It can originate from Satan or evil spirits. So these are the places where dreams can come from. Now, what are dreams for? Now, we know dreams are the language of the spirit. So when, whenever God is talking, when God is speaking to us, one of the primary ways that we see that God talks to his people outside of an inner witness, outside of what the Bible calls similitudes, 
um, which all deals with inner dealings, the heart, sensing, knowing, things like that, um, is also dreams. Now, with dreams, they're more powerful than you realize, and I, and I want to show you why. One of the purposes of dreams is to be a portal for what you see in the dream to enter your life. Okay, so, for example, how does Solomon receive an impartation of divine wisdom? It was through a dream. So this means that when you, one of the ways that God equips you for your ministry even, is he shows it to you in a dream, and when you're in that dream, what you're seeing, you're also receiving an, an impartation for. So if you've ever had a dream where you're casting out devils in a dream, you didn't just see it. He gave you an impartation through that dream. If you had a dream and you were seeing something in the prophetic realm, you weren't just seeing something, you were receiving a prophetic impartation. If you saw yourself doing miracles, in my life I've received different gifts of the Spirit by way of dreams. One of the gifts of the Spirit that I, I received in a dream years ago was through, um, in a dream, I saw a prophet that I respected, and that prophet came and, and prophesied to me, and they, and they prophesied to my hands in the dream, and they said, there are, the, the working of miracles is in your hands. And then I woke up, and my physical hands were still burning from the dream, because dreams are one of the ways that God equips us in the supernatural. Okay, and so, so, so we see that dreams have power to bring things into the natural realm. This is the, the point that I'm making. The same is true in a counterfeit way of what the enemy does is that he uses dreams to bring or to program certain things to take place in your life. He also uses dreams to defile the spirit. Okay, so he uses dreams to defile the spirit. This is good. Um, I'm going to give you a list of things Satan uses dreams or dreams to do, okay? Number one, he wants to defile the spirit man. He wants to defile the spirit man. Uh, okay, and there's a lot of things I could tell you about a defiled spirit. But just so you know, whenever the spirit man is defiled, like do you guys remember in Revelation chapter 3, the Bible talks about eye salve, healing the eyes. Um, whenever the spirit is defiled, you could, the best way I could describe it to you, it's almost like parts of the spirit man begin to be damaged. For example, if there's an individual that they continue to, let's say they watch pornography and they watch it over and over, what's happening is not only their, their eyes are being defiled and therefore it's damaging their spiritual sight. Okay? And so the enemy wants to defile the spirit man because when the spirit man is defiled, there are certain functions of the spirit man that cannot be carried out. There's a lot I could say, but uh, are you guys familiar with um, uh, Daniel chapter 5? And it says that Daniel had an excellent spirit. Now notice the list of things that was said after. It, it, when it says he had an excellent spirit, it wasn't saying that Daniel did everything with excellence, even though I'm not, I'm not saying he didn't. It was referring to the abilities found in his spirit. Interpreting dreams was one. I want to tell you a mystery. Did you know that dream interpretation is not necessarily, there is a gift of the spirit for that, but there's also a maturity of the spirit man that can interpret spiritual things. So sometimes an inability to interpret dreams is more connected to an immaturity. Oh, my goodness. Okay, let me, let me say this. Do you guys remember when Daniel read the writing on the wall? It was in a language that wasn't in the earth, but his spirit knew the language. Hmm. What if I told you this? Did you know there's not a language that your spirit doesn't know? Okay, so when, okay, when you're in prayer, watch this, I want to show you something. When you're in prayer, many people, when you first start off praying in tongues, your, your tongue sounds the same in the beginning. But if you keep praying, your tongues start to change, right? What happened? Now, Paul said, I can speak in the tongues of angels are the tongues of men. This means your tongues are associated to a spiritual geography. Hmm. What am I saying? As you're praying, you're moving places. That's what I'm saying. And the language you're speaking is the language of that reality. So, so, so it's not that we're trying to get our tongues fancier. No. 
Wherever you're speaking in tongues is associated to where, what, whatever you need to be saying to interact with that realm. So, so as you're praying, you're speaking to those angels there. You're speaking, but as you move, there's a different geography. There may be a different language in that region of heaven. Okay? So, this is good. So, interpreting dreams was found in him. The next thing that was found in him was dissolving or, or, or was this understanding riddles or difficult, complex things. Watch this. You first got saved, and, and let's say some of you, let's say you were more uh, denominational when you first got saved through childhood. Then you come around this crazy apostolic and prophetic movement stuff. And people start teaching all this supernatural angels and gold dust and feathers. And when you first hear it, you don't understand it. You're born again, but you don't understand it. Why? Your spirit is still maturing. When it says Daniel had an excellent spirit, it's referring to the maturity of his inner man. This is good. Let me say one more thing to you. David said a prayer, and he said, Lord, light my candle. Didn't he say that? He was referring to his spirit. Now watch what he said. And then I will run through a troop. And then I will leap over a wall. I hope you just caught what, what was just revealed. When the enemy defiles the spirit man, he limits your function in the supernatural. Notice that the spirit had to be activated for David to run through a troop. For David to leap over a wall. So, so this is why the enemy, has, one of the goals is to defile the spirit man, to remove the fire out of your spirit. So that your spirit is not activated. So that things that when it is activated that you're, that you're anointed to do, you cannot really do them because they flow from your spirit. So um, if I was to describe your spirit, notice that God could not, that the Holy Spirit could not come into his full expression of ministry on the earth until the spirit of man was awakened. So this is why the Bible says this. Because you may say, well, he was in his full ministry. Was he in his full ministry in the Old Testament, just ministering primarily to Israel? He went from only ministering primarily in Israel to the outpour being on the whole earth on all flesh. That was connected to men's spirit being regenerated. Why? Because the Bible says, he that is joined to the Lord is what? One spirit with him. So that means your spirit... And the Holy Spirit in Christ is one spirit. So now you see the picture of why the enemy would want to defile the inner man. If he could limit, if he could damage the spirit of man, we cannot flow to the full potential with the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's what he desires. Okay, so this is why there's defiling dreams. Okay, the next thing the enemy will use dreams for is to program Bad things to happen in your life. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, and then, once again, I'm not, I, there's no way I'm going to be able to teach all this just tonight. How does he do it? And I'll give you a couple examples. Let's say that you have a dream of a storm. You have a dream of a storm. What is your spirit telling you? Or what is being communicated to your spirit? If you see an earthquake... If you see a tornado in a dream, if you see a violent, and, and I'm not referring to like the lightnings of God like John G. Lake. Um, I've seen those, by the way. It's amazing. I'm referring to like a, a storm that's evil. It's, it's letting you know that spirits of destruction have been sent against you. And so if you don't pray and don't engage in spiritual warfare, something would be destroyed in your life somewhere. Okay. And so, so many people, they have dreams of, of that nature, right? Where, like they, they dream and they see, oh, my God, in this dream, there was a horrible flood and it was so bad. If they don't rise up in spiritual warfare, it's letting you know there are spirits that are sent to bring some type of major destruction, okay? Um, another example, um, and this is a big one. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to scan the room. Let me see. I, I, I don't know. I have a few young people. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep it as clean as I can. Because we know that the enemy is very filthy. And so sometimes it's very difficult to explain his realities. But I'll say this. Um, when we were teenagers, science, um, they referred to this, and I'll call it a, a water dream. Okay? 
That's the best way. <laughs> I know. It's the best way that I could describe it. We'll call it a water dream. Okay? So, now, now science will tell you that's completely normal. Nothing's wrong with that at all. That, that happens to everybody at some point. But is it really normal for something so defiling to happen to someone while they're very young? I want you to know that's not at all normal. And, and it's a very demonic dream. And it's actually one of, one of the more destructive type dreams that can happen to an individual. And the reason why, this is a spirit coming to know you intimately. And from that moment, that spirit marries you. Now, hear what I'm saying. I'm going to say a term. It's, it's not a familiar term in the United States. Now, it's not a biblical term. So I want you to understand what I'm saying. But it's based on a biblical principle. And I know that may sound uncomfortable, but I, I usually clear the air by saying the word Trinity. It's nowhere in the Bible, but you use it. Why do you use it? Because it's based on a principle. It's based on the principle of the Godhead. So, so just because something is used to describe something in the Bible, but it's not directly stated in the Bible, doesn't make it demonic. It only makes it demonic when we're uncomfortable with it. See what I'm saying? And that's what happens in the church. But, but here's my point. I want to use the term spirit marriage, and, and, and the, before I really go too deep into it, I want to prove to you that you already believe in spirit marriage. The bridegroom and the bride. You actually already believe in spirit marriage. If you've ever prayed, Lord, the spirit and the bride say come. If you've ever taught the parable of the foolish virgins and the wise virgins, you are, what you are teaching is spirit marriage. Being spiritually married to God. Right? It's quiet. I know it's uncomfortable. I know. But it, but it doesn't make it not true if it's uncomfortable. So, so hear what I'm saying? If you believe that Jesus is the bridegroom, you are, it, is Jesus a spirit? Yes. So you're saying that you spiritually believe that you can be married to him. That's a spirit marriage. Now, the reason why that principle is important to remember is that the devil is a counterfeiter. There's nothing in his kingdom that he did not first have to see something authentic to make a false version of it. So he's made a false version of spirit marriage. That's what I'm saying. So with that said, what, what is it? Now, the Bible says in Genesis 6 that there were fallen angels that came down. They saw that women were beautiful, the daughters of men. That's what it says. And it says they laid with them, but it goes further than that. It doesn't only say that. It says they married them. So right there in the Bible, we see angels that are fallen, marry physical people. In Genesis chapter 6, it's a spirit marriage, a marriage between a physical being and a spirit. Um, and then they bear children and had children and they had giants. It's not really taught a lot because, once again, America's intellectual, and that doesn't make sense intellectually. But how does, how does something like this take place today? It takes place through dreams. So this is what I'm trying to say. If you've ever had a dream where there was an intimate advance made on you in the dream, it was a demonic dream, not a good one. Um, and, and, and one of the most evident ways to know that someone is dealing with a spirit spouse is that they have those types of defiled dreams. I want to give you a couple of symptoms and some other things that I have found that, this spirit, uh, that these spirits do. Um, and then I'm going to explain incubus, succubus, and spirit spouse. I want to describe them so that you can understand what they mean. Now, first I want to tell you a quick story. Um, I was actually in New York two years ago. And while I was in New York, I began to preach on deliverance. Um, and as I was preaching on deliverance, a little girl walks up to me. She comes up to the stage, and when she comes up to the stage, I'm thinking she has a prayer request. So I, I lean over to hear what she's saying. The music was very loud, and when I lean over, she looks at me, and she goes, Satan hates you. Immediately, I recognized that a demon was manifesting through the little girl. So this removes all our theology that children cannot have demons. Um, also, the fact that most of the deliverances that Jesus did were on children as far as the ones that were described to us. So, so anyway, what happens is this provoked me, and I decided we're going to cast out devils now. So, so I stopped teaching. 
um, like I'm doing now, and I, and, I, and I just began to go, go and lead the people into deliverance prayers. So as we were doing deliverance prayers, demons, they began to manifest all over the place. They're manifesting everywhere. All, I mean, everywhere that you could look, everybody was manifesting. Uh, the church I'm in, it is a, um, it's a Nigerian church. Um, and so as, as demons are manifesting, this, this uh, young man who looked like he was probably in his early or late, maybe late 20s, he starts to beat on his chest like this. And as he's beating on his chest, I knew a demon was manifesting. Um, and then we began to deal with this spirit. Well, the demon says, you can't cast me out. I'm his wife. And so, so the next question I ask is, how did you enter this young man? Now, let me also insert this. This, this is going to be, this is really good, by the way. I'm saying that because it's, it's the anointing is teaching us. So I'm actually complimenting God. I want to say something that is a major error in the prophetic or in the deliverance movement today, but but you tend to see it more with individuals who don't really do deliverance a lot. They say things like, "You will never encounter a time where you should not use the gifts of the Spirit to do deliverance." Now, I tell people this all the time. I believe in deliverance in every way Jesus exercised it. But here's the problem. To say that every time there's a demon, that you're guaranteed to get a word of knowledge, that you're guaranteed to have the Lord give you the discerning of spiritual function, is full of pride. And the reason why is because Jesus had to ask Legion's name. If Jesus himself had to ask, that means that he wasn't getting uh, from the gifts of the Spirit a, a discernment about his name or what he was. Jesus did deliverance by his authority in that moment. Okay? So, so this is what I'm presenting to you. The Bible says all the works that Jesus did cannot, the, that volumes of books could be written and the world could not contain them all. This means that the Holy Spirit saw fit that every deliverance account we see in Scripture wasn't all of them. He gave us the ones we needed. What this means is that may not have been the only time Jesus asked the Spirit's name. That was the one time we were given. Oh, my goodness, I feel God. So, I'm not, but I'm also going to add the balance. That doesn't mean we do it every time. So, that means when we do deliverance, every single time we do deliverance, we don't have to ask the Spirit's name. This means sometimes we do deliverance, demons will come out by our teaching. Sometimes when we do deliverance, they'll come out in the spiritual warfare prayer. Sometimes they'll come out at the laying on of hands. Sometimes they'll come out when we begin to renounce and repent. And people will start having demons leave them just from repenting and renouncing. There'll be times where the fire of God is moving in the worship. And demons start coming out while the worship is going. Right? There'll be times where spirits are coming out. Right? Just off of what's this? Just spiritual warfare prayer. Then there'll be times where we'll get words of knowledge and we'll call out a certain function of a spirit. And then the discerning of spirits may function and we'll highlight the name of a demon and command it to come out. But there's many ways it'll come out. So, so we have to be open to all the realms of deliverance, all the ways that God does deliverance. So in this case, I needed to ask the name. And so he said, I'm, I'm his wife. I said, how did you enter this man? And he said, through pornography. I've done spiritual warfare of people that a spirit was blocking them from pregnancy. I've done spiritual warfare prayer. I remember someone came. They, they flew into our ministry from Dallas. And when they came in from Dallas, uh, we started praying for them, and nothing was moving in the deliverance session. We could not figure out because we can't do it in a cookie-cut way. It's not the same every time. And as we were trying to figure it out, I had to back up and say, Holy Spirit, why are we not getting any, anywhere with this deliverance? And he said, I want you to ask her about the dream she had the other day. And I said, okay. And so we, we, we kind of regroup, and I'm like, I feel led to ask you, what dream have you recently had? And this is what she said. I had a dream that there was a, a spirit, and this spirit, it, it had a canvas like it was painting, and once again, I'm going to say this very PG. But once again, I told you, the enemy's dreams, they defile people. So sometimes describing them is very difficult to do because we're trying to say things that are defiled in a very holy way. Well, well the, the spirit was drawing her female organ 
and it was painting a serpent going into it. This is, and then it looked at her and said, you cannot, she had been trying to get deliverance for years, and the Spirit said, you cannot cast me out. And it said, because me and you have a covenant. Now, when this happened, the Lord spoke to me, and a verse came in my spirit in Job. And the verse was, I will make a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon a young lady. What does that mean? That means evil covenants can be made even with certain body parts. That means sometimes we're breaking a covenant. We're not just, watch this, we're not just uh, dismantling an evil altar. Sometimes the covenant was made with a physical body part. Y'all don't believe me. I just showed you in scripture that a covenant, a holy covenant could be made with our eyes. That we would decide to not use our eyes for evil. When God is, or when the enemy establishes an evil covenant, that part of the, of the man becomes Kept captive to the use of the enemy, and that part of them begins to be used as an instrument for the demonic, for evil. This is good. So, so in my experience, we've cast out devils that have blocked pregnancies, and it's been the spirit spouse. I've noticed that a, a common denominator, now this is not biblical, this is experience that I'm sharing now. I know it's a common denominator between women who have stillborns, women that... Uh, deal with a lot of miscarriages and things like that, many of them needed deliverance from the spirit spouse. I've discovered that in my experience, these spirits hate children bearing. I've discovered also another thing these spirits fight against is marriage. These spirits hate marriage. Now, there are many spirits that fight marriage, just like there are many sicknesses and diseases and things like that. So I'm not saying this is the only one, but one of the number one spirits that fight marriages, even people getting married. Like, for example, I've done deliverance on people where we, after the deliverance, they'll tell me, my aunt's single, this person's single, everyone in my family line is single, like everybody. And many times it's connected to the spirit spouse. Something else I noticed in my personal experience of casting out this particular spirit, these particular spirits, excuse me, is this. They tend to enter in um, through rape and molestation. Now, I tell people this, and, and I want you to understand um, what the enemy uses rape and molestation for. I know it's a sensitive subject, um, but the enemy uses rape and molestation to, to, to fill people with many spirits that will affect them for the rest of their life if they do not get deliverance. And one of the things that, that, he, that he gives them is a spirit spouse. And that spirit from that time begins to engineer intimate encounters in their life that will further bring them under bondage. This is what it does. So, so um, there, there's so much I could say here, but, but the spirit spouse will engineer a life of promiscuity. It will engineer um, a life of any form of sexual immorality. So, so anytime that someone is habitually dealing with, um, with that, even um, with pornography, for example, we know, I've heard many people say pornography is not someone entertaining themselves, it's someone entertaining a spirit. Well, what spirit are you entertaining? It's the spirit spouse. Now, now watch this. Um, you have incubus, which is a spirit, um, and this, this spirit called incubus, it means to lay upon. That's what it means. To lay down on. Now, many people that experience sleep paralysis, um, there are several reasons why you can experience sleep paralysis. One of them, it, when it tends to be the primary one, is, is a spirit spouse. Now, you have to understand that what the enemy uses these spirits to do, there's a, uh, um, once again, I have to say something in a holy way. Um, the reason why they're, they're working to get you to a release in your dreams um, are released through pornography is because they they collect and they steal DNA. Now, now DNA 
is very powerful. We see in the Bible, there's a lot that could be said about blood. There's a lot that could be said about DNA. Witches, specifically, they love DNA. In fact, when you look at witchcraft and the nature of witchcraft in general, described in like Nahum, you'll see several things about witchcraft. One of them is that witchcraft requires blood um, in order to be highly effective. The next thing you'll see is there's a lot, always, wherever there's a lot of witchcraft, there's a lot of murder. There's a lot of sexual immorality where there's a lot of witchcraft, and that's described in Nahum. Um, and, and so this is my point that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm working to make. The spirit spouse is a witchcraft spirit, and there's an undeniable connection between sexual immorality and witchcraft. In fact, hmm, I'm trying to ask God how deep into this I can go. In fact, so many countless people are in bondage to sexual sin in the house of God, and it's not because they're bad people. It's not because they're evil. It's, it's not even because they don't desire to be free. In my experience of casting out this devil, this, this incubus, which is the male expression of this spirit. Then there's succubus, which is the female expression of this spirit. Now, now remember this. Succubus and incubus are the chief of the world of sexual demons. That means there are other demons that operate underneath the spirit spouse are underneath incubus and succubus as well. Lust being one of them, just giving a couple common examples. Um, but, but there's something I want to say. These powers are also behind abortion. These, these spirits, um, once again, they, they do not want a person to have children. They do not want you to have the joy of marriage. And if you are married, their goal is to make your marriage suffer. Um, these are spirits, and, and I want to give an example. And once again, I know this is a very sensitive subject, um, but let's say that there's someone who, when they were in the world, uh, they were promiscuous. Let's say that this person was maybe molested as a child. They grow up all through their dating. They were active intimately with people before marriage. Then they get married. The first thing you'll notice is that the intimacy in their marriage is not strong, but they were able to be intimate outside of marriage. This is also the work of that spirit. Because I tell people this, spirits do not desire what is holy. And so, so if someone, watch this, so if someone's active before marriage and the spirits in them have a desire for what's not holy, then they get married, those same spirits no longer motivate you for intimacy. The, what they motivate you for is things outside of marriage. Okay, so individuals that, that struggle with sexual thoughts, they struggle with it all the time, and, and, and wedding rings don't bring deliverance. And so, so someone wears a wedding ring, it does not mean that you've been delivered of the devil. In fact, um, one, of the, one of the worst teachings I hear sometimes, if, if it's not taught correctly, is it's better to marry than to burn. There are people that have married someone that's a demonic assignment against their life just off of that principle. And, and, and you have to understand that there, there are many things that could be said about these spirits. But another thing that the uh, spirit spouse brings into the life of people is rejection. Now, there are other ways someone can deal with rejection. Um, so I'm not telling you this is the only way, but it, it's something that is brought. In fact, if you notice, there's an undeniable connection between people that deal with rejection and finding a false security in, in sexual immorality. Um, it's because the, the spirit works to do that. I'll add this, too, for parents, um, especially of prophetic children. There is a reason why there is a large number of people who are singers, people that are creatives in nature, very creative, and people who are like called to be prophets as children, why they're attacked with perversion many times early in life. That is not a coincidence. Just so you know, it's, it's not a coincidence that, it, that if you look at the music corner in most churches, you, you see that there's struggle with sexual immorality. It's not a coincidence. And, and when, once again, we're not highlighting it. Oh, like it's just at a couple of no. If you if you meet a hundred people that are in music, you'll see that many of them struggled with perversion at some point in life in a heavy way. That's by design. That's engineered, because the devil 
If, if someone is called to release a sound or usher the people into the presence of God, just so you know, the, the assignment to disrupt intimacy with God is sexual immorality. That's why when you look, there, there are many ways that the, the devil has attacked prophets throughout history. One of them is through mental warfare. So prophets being attacked by like Python, Jezebel, but being attacked with suicidal thoughts, things like that. You see that common with prophets, mind problems, which, by the way, is not normal. But the second thing that you see is that many prophetic people, their biggest Achilles heel, what David's biggest problem was not Goliath. It was his appetite for intimacy that began with the open door of rejection, okay, being rejected by his father, being rejected to the degree that when Samuel came and said, you know, bring all your sons, he didn't even get brought up. He, that means he wasn't even there. He said, bring all your sons. They bring every single son except David. So, so my point is, um, these spirits, they, they work to introduce rejection into the person's life because rejection can be an open door for sexual sin. What many people are looking for when they're, when they're battling with promiscuity and things like that, they're looking for the security of love and intimacy. That's really what they're looking for. Okay? Um, let's keep going. This is good. Um, in my time of... Okay. Understood. So in my time of dealing with these particular spirits, I have encountered them bringing many problems into people's marriages, problems bearing children, problems having intimacy with God, because through them, it hardens the heart. I have encountered so many things. And I believe that God wants to deliver Many all over the nation, all over America, from sexual sin. In pulpits, churches, because leadership doesn't exempt you. It doesn't exempt us from these struggles. And God is, is refining, he's purifying, and he's bringing deliverance. But in order to do that, he first must expose the work of this particular spirit. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to lift your hands right where you are. Would you lift your hands? And I want you to say this prayer. I want you to say this prayer with me. And God is going to bring such freedom. Now, I told you with deliverance, um, tonight I don't have time to lay hands on you. I don't have time. And so I want you to receive your deliverance by faith. Now, some of you, the deliverance will be for you, but sometimes you're also going to be standing in the gap for your family, for your generations, for your children, for your grandchildren, even for unborn generations, you can stand in the gap. And so I want you to repeat after me. Say, Father, it's in the name of Jesus. I thank you for the children's bread. I thank you for your power to deliver. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I come to you asking for deliverance. I ask you to deliver my family, and I stand in the gap now for my generations. Right now, Lord, I repent. For all sexual immorality in my life and in my generations. Lord, every open door that has been open to sexual spirits through my generations. Today, Lord, I renounce every evil covenant with the spirit spouse. I renounce every evil covenant that has been made in my dreams. I renounce every evil covenant that has been made through eating food, 
whether in the dreams or in the natural. Right now, in Jesus' name, by the blood of Jesus, I ask you to set me free from any spirits that entered my life or my family line through rape, through molestation, or any other act. Lord, I come out of agreement with the enemy and with the kingdom of Satan in any way in Jesus' name. So, Lord, let your blood set me free from every power that comes from the realm of Satan. I receive my deliverance in Jesus' name. So, Lord, I thank you for mighty deliverance. I thank you for delivering your people. I thank you, Lord, that even as they leave, as they sleep tonight, God, that they'll have dreams and visitations of deliverance, that they'll experience freedom, that chains will be broken, God, that curses will be reversed, and that the evil powers that have been operating against them in the night, that the power of God would remove and extract them from their life in Jesus' name. But we declare the authority of your resurrection over your people, and we release the reality of your blood. So, Lord, let your people walk in total freedom of the enemy. And I ask you to continue to pour revelation pertaining to this realm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.